Hi, we have Ed and Mike here from our Emerging Markets team. They're based in San Francisco. We haven't done a new product within Paradise Investments for 10 years. We've been going for 20 years. This is our fifth product. All the other four products have performed very well since inception. The key things that we look when we're researching or doing due diligence on a team is that they are focused on love accountability, love being responsible performance. Uh, we have limited FUM generally in our products are limited capacity, so they're happy to do that, just focus on the performance for clients, and that they are very focused on capital preservation. It's really important for us that we continue to deliver good numbers, but we are concerned about the downside of investing in stocks. Ed and Mike, do you want to just talk briefly about your background? Sure. Uh, so Mike and I uh, met about nine years ago. Uh, first, uh, we met at uh, Thornburg in Santa Fe, um, where we were on two separate teams, but working actually quite uh, closely uh, right next to each other. Um, and then about three years later, uh, we got the opportunity to leave with uh, one of the PMs at Thornburg to launch an emerging market strategy uh, for a firm called Artisan Partners. Um, and that's where Mike and I uh, again were for about three years working as associate portfolio managers. Um, and then in 2017, uh, we had the uh, opportunity to meet uh, you know, Kevin Beck um, and also yourself um, and learn more about uh, Paradise. And um, I think what appealed to us um, was the uh, philosophy was well aligned to kind of how we uh, thought investing should be done. Um, some of those things that were quite interesting to us um, were the fact that uh, there was high accountability, um, high autonomy, um, and uh, the ability to um, kind of focus on what matters, which is uh, performance for the client. And, and I think it's, what's important too is that that these products are generally limited capacity type product, emerging markets, because they can be significant, but if you have, as we have done with all our funds, we've li limited the funds under management so that we can focus on the performance. But the emerging markets is a, a, a very big index, and there are about 26 countries, so how do you filter or break down where the, the, the funds actually go in that universe? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Um, you know, I think it's a, a very disparate list of, of countries in the index. Um, what we would say is it's hard to kind of draw too many generalizations. Uh, many of the countries are in uh, different stages of development. Um, for our purposes, um, I would say that firstly, we are bottoms up focused, uh, not top down asset allocation driven. Um, and then we also focus secondly on the underlying economic exposure. Um, as opposed to the geographic domicile of uh, the companies we invest in. Um, and thirdly, we're very much focused on the domestic demand uh, of the uh, companies that we're investing in. Um, we're focused on uh, companies that benefit from the rising per capita income uh, levels over time, which is what we think uh, EM investors are really excited about, um, as opposed to some of the export-driven opportunities that had been a big part of the index previously. Um, but at the country level in practice, um, we have been uh, more overweight, uh, China, India, and Brazil. Um, those are some of the larger uh, participants in the index um, uh, with, the, with very deep capital markets and very good business models. Um, and then uh, we're also uh, very light on the Korea and Taiwan side of things um, as we don't view those markets to be all that emerging and quite similar to the developed markets. So I remember when I was uh, investing in small caps many years ago, I was looking for there's lots of opportunities in the small cap land in Australia and I look through your portfolio and I can see uh, the similar kind of traits that I look at when I'm looking at companies that are small or that, that are big but are growing in their own right. Can you just talk about the, the valuations at the moment in emerging, in emerging markets and, and developed markets and how they compare? Yeah, so uh, from a valuation perspective, um, we've taken a, a look at it. If you look at just the forward PE, which is, and I'm choosing PE just because that's a metric that you know, is widely followed and, and widely talked about. Um, the forward PE for the MSCI Emerging Markets Index is about 12 times, um, while uh, the developed market indices like the S&P are at 18 times and uh, the world indices are somewhere in between. Um, what's interesting to us is if you uh, take a step further and you look at the sector multiples, um, it tells a much different story. Um, so at the headline basis, you might think that EM is very cheap on the surface, um, but when you look at where that uh, valuation uh, cheapness is coming from, um, it's really coming from sectors like uh, financials, energy, materials, 
um, utilities. Those aren't really areas that um, we prefer to invest in. We uh, prefer to focus more on uh, the consumer side of things, the uh, internet businesses, the healthcare, uh, the discretionary side. Um, so for us, uh, if, if you're solely focused on valuation, paying no attention to the quality of the business model, um, the growth characteristics, um, then you might say, well, let me go buy uh, you know, the energy businesses, the financial businesses, because that's where the valuation arbitrage is. Um, what we would say is that low valuation doesn't really equal lower risk. Um, and some of these companies are actually some of the worst offenders uh, of the ESG uh, side of things. Um, they're also uh, you know, businesses that aren't really run for shareholders. They're businesses that don't earn above their cost of capital. Um, so uh, you know, we prefer uh, to focus on the businesses that are. Um, and that's where we think active management can really play a role. So how, how do you manage the risk in the, in the portfolio? Yeah, and I think, I think in terms of uh, the emerging markets being a volatile place, I think sometimes people equate volatility with risk. But in reality, risk is, in our opinion, in a practical investing sense, more the risk of a, a sharp downward movement in a stock that results in, in, in permanent capital impairment. So what we're trying to avoid is permanent capital impairment. Um, in terms of the, the asset class itself, again, it's very hard to paint with you know, uh, a broad brush the emerging markets because it's very heterogeneous. You have 25 plus emerging markets, each with their own political situation, their own macro backdrop, uh, their own rule of law. And so you need to look at each individual country. Um, so from a macro perspective, we have a, a framework that allows us to kind of look at each situation independently um, and, and determine where the risks are. Um, and, and what, kind of, um, what kind of hurdle rate we need to be compensated for that risk. Uh, at the stock level, it's all about business model for us. We're very focused on companies that um, help us mitigate the, mitigate the risk by having sustainable free cash flow generation, high returns on invested capital. We're looking for you know, very well-managed balance sheets that are appropriate for, for the business that they're involved in. So, um, so again, at the portfolio level, we're looking to, to mitigate risk both through, through a macro framework and through uh, a very specific stock selection uh, process. Uh, finally, we, 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 we like deliberate diversification, uh, deliberate diversification across geographies and across sectors uh, to further dampen the, the overall risk of the portfolio. So I noticed that you do have a uh, reasonable weighting in consumer discretionary um, and the consumption side of things, not so much waiting in the technology side of things. So you've spoken uh, to me in the past about when I asked you about the volatility compared to other emerging market funds um, and the index itself. Why would you think that you guys are different to the stock standard emerging markets portfolio? Uh, there's a number of things. Uh, you know, uh, when we look at building our portfolio, um, we're really focused on uh, mitigating that or minimizing the correlation profile that we have. Um, one of the ways that we uh, go about doing that um, is that we're not uh, you know, willing to just pay any price um, for uh, any business. Uh, I think it's very easy to say you know, you're a quality fund and you're willing to pay up for you know, all the businesses that we would have heard of um, and create a portfolio of Alibaba, Tencent, TSMC, Samsung's. Um, but for us, um, while that might be the majority of our portfolio, we do uh, have a portion of our portfolio um, where we will invest in um, some of the more uh, cyclically driven value names out there um, where there is still a structural growth story underpinning them. Um, we might also invest in uh, some of these companies that um, are going through some sort of turnaround um, where they're not being viewed yet as a compounder, um, but where we can see a noticeable change uh, at the company level um, so those are the things that we'll look at to try and diversify our, our correlation profile and, and ensure hopefully that we have kind of a smoother return over time. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I do see the portfolio as, as, like I've said, similar to some of the Aussie funds. So a lot of the now big companies that exist in Australia were once smaller companies, and that's the opportunity set for investing in something like an emerging markets fund or a high growth small cap portfolio. You spoke uh, recently um, in, in the uh, papers about uh, an exposure to China. Can you talk about that and why you see that as still an existing opportunity? 
Yeah, so, so you're right, China is a, is a large portion of our portfolio. I think one of the things we really like about China is the fact that they're, they're leapfrogging the West in terms of, 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 of technological innovation in many, many regards. One area that really comes to mind for us is, is the payment sector. Um, in China, you have over 800 million internet users, and already you have 80% of all transactions done through mobile. Um, this is way ahead of the West in terms of you know, penetration of, of mobile payments. Um, this is being enabled by you know, very large, you know, innovative companies like Alibaba, Tencent, um, that are you know, basically changing the game in terms of how payments are done in China. And what's very interesting is China actually skipped the, the whole credit card penetration step. Um, when you go to China, it's, it's actually kind of foreign to them for you to come and try and pay with a credit card. I remember last time I was there, it was, I, I got looked at very strangely when I presented a credit card for payment at a convenience store because it, the vast majority of payments are done through mobile. Um, and and mobile's just, it, payments is just one example of the innovation that's taking place. So it's actually outpacing the West um, and creating unique investment opportunities for us. You also see it on, on the artificial intelligence side of things and the fusion of AI and FinTech um, and, and, and the list goes on. So I think from, uh, from a, a long tail growth opportunity, the, the play here is really increased productivity, new business models, disruptive business models, uh, and leading the way in terms of tech innovation. So, so what would kind of derail your enthusiasm for in, investing in China? Yeah, there, there's a couple things that um, would worry us. Uh, the first um, would be, you know, China has been more focused recently on opening up their financial markets, which is good um, for us. But if China were to ever uh, go to the other extreme um, and somehow change their rule of law or um, somehow instruct uh, some of their uh, uh, VIE owners to uh, begin to take back some of the companies um, that are listed in the U.S. Uh, under this uh, VIE structure, you know, that would be, you know, a huge red flag and that would lead to um, a lot of capital destruction and um, probably set China back um, and also make us uh, quite wary um, about investing in China. Um, the other area where uh, you would need to watch out for is the, um, the overall debt problem that China has um, taken on uh, since the global financial crisis. Uh, their debt to GDP um, has gone uh, from essentially about 160 percent um, to over 300 percent um, today and uh, it seems like uh, for them to continue to grow, they will have to continue to uh, use leverage as a tool for them. Um, so for us, what we would be watching out for um, is uh, any meaningful deleverage from them um, that would kind of slow their growth, um, any sort of big uh, issues on the property side, which a lot of people use for savings and, and wealth creation. Um, those things could begin to signal a, a turn in the overall uh, economy. So what other countries uh, would you be looking or are you looking at at the, at the moment which generate great investment ideas? Yeah, so um, Brazil is an area that we're quite excited about. So uh, LATAM uh, over the last decade has really kind of shrunk in terms of size um, and contribution to the overall emerging markets index. Um, and, and Brazil particularly has also shrunk, but, um, but we're seeing some, some signs of turn um, around in, in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, the main thing is um, they've had a change in government, um, so they have this new president, uh, Bolsonaro, who's in place, and he's been able to more recently uh, pass through this pension reform bill. Um, and that's kind of the start uh, for hopefully more reform to come through. Um, so uh, our hope is that you know, that should bring down um, the country risk premiums that should bring forward um, some more foreign investment um, and, and that should hopefully position Brazil for um, a path for uh, longer term growth. Um, and within there, there have been kind of a number of stocks that we uh, have uh, invested in that have provided us a good alpha. So why do you use PEs as opposed to some other valuation methodology when you're comparing the value of your portfolio to the um, index? Um, so uh, for us, that's just a widely reported statistic. Um, so therefore, uh, you know, it's just easy for uh, us to be able to pull up the PE of the uh, index and the PE of, uh, um, you know, across EM versus 
uh, DM. Uh, in practice, when we're thinking about valuation, um, we make a number of adjustments um, to what we think the underlying cash flows represent. And for us, our focus has always been on cash earnings. Um, that's what we think uh, drives value over time. Um, so we look for uh, what the underlying growth could be in the cash earnings. Um, for us, uh, on the valuation front, multiple is usually a, a secondary uh, discussion for us. Uh, what we care about is uh, the quality of the business and the ability for that business to compound over a long period of time. Uh, because when you're holding a business for five years, 10 years, 15 years, um, really what's going to drive the outperformance is that underlying compounding as opposed to uh, the multiple re-rating from 10 times to 15 times. When we're looking at investments in, say, a developed country, and you're looking at GDP growth low, and you're looking at these little companies or various companies that are trying to grow against a, a generally slow growth GDP, it excites me when you talk about the various companies um, and the opportunities that you have compared to uh, developed countries' indexes and investment opportunities. So if you can get those companies but reduce the volatility and the risk, it obviously comes up with a reasonably well-performing Portfolio. So if you were to just briefly compare some of the developed countries' multiples compared to some of the emerging markets country multiples in similar businesses, are they quite different? Uh, yes. Um, so, the, uh, so in terms of, I guess I'll use some examples. Um, usually uh, when you're comparing some of our businesses, um, such as uh, Alibaba and Tencent relative to um, some of the uh, leading internet companies in developed markets. Um, the valuations are probably not all that dissimilar, but the growth characteristics um, that are provided for in the emerging markets are uh, usually uh, much faster. Um, but there is a country risk element to uh, where EM uh, can be more volatile. There are more things that could go wrong uh, from a political uh, environment, from a um, from a currency perspective um, that we need to be uh, aware of and, and also think about. Um, so, and I think that's why we like to maintain uh, broad-based diversification uh, over the portfolio where um, we're not you know, being subjected to too much undue risk from a single security. Great. No, I think it's, I think it's a fantastic way for people over the long term to compound, uh, to compound their money and compound funds and compound growth. Uh, because of the opportunity set that exists. So thank you very much.